This is a live mic check. One, two, three, four, five. Second mic check, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Third mic check, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen.
are on the air. Greetings. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the February 25th Growth Planning Committee meeting. My name is Paul Hogan. I'm acting chair tonight, and we'll introduce ourselves, starting with Warner down there. Warner Gilliam. Mike Corsi. James McMahon. Paul Hogan again. <laughs> Barbara Barwise. Janet Powell. And we have uh, Tom Morgan. Liz Durfee. And Liz Durfee, our consultants who are helping us with the uh, comprehensive plan. Um, first item is our agenda from February 11th, my birthday. Um, those of you who. <laughs> who were here didn't know it was my birthday. I tried to keep that quiet. You, you were on TV. You could have I know. <laughs> no one's saying happy birthday, birthday to me. Maybe next year. Um, any comments on the minutes? If not, can I have a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve. Thank you, Jim. Second? Second. Janet, thank you. All in favor? <clears throat> thank you. Um, our next item on the agenda is our first review of the housing chapter. Tom, I guess you're going to take it? Yes, I am. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, we, uh, we, we did a lot of digging with uh, statistics, comparing uh, Kennebunkport with surrounding towns and with the county, and sometimes with a larger geographical area. Uh, and there were no, I don't think anything I'm going to show you tonight is going to be a particular surprise. I think you know most of the story already. Uh, these these are the, uh, the subjects related to housing that we, we took a look at, and quite a few of them. Um, it was kind of more extensive than your, your last comprehensive plan in terms of the um, different areas we looked into. And we started by trying to get a handle on uh, how many dwelling units are in town. Um, the, the graph on the left relies on the uh, U.S. Census for the most part, the, the decennial census, the one they do every 10 years. And on the right, we, uh, we, we found a more accurate source of counting houses, and that's how many growth management permits were issued by the town of Kinney mm -hmm. Port. So I, I think the one on the left is fairly reliable, and the one on the right I have even more confidence in. Warren, does that look, look like it's a, we're in the ballpark to you? I know we're in the yeah. ballpark, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. So we have since 1980, we have almost, we have over a thousand more housing units. Yes. Than when you. And, and the other thing I'm noticing that I don't see in many cities and towns is the, your growth since 1980 has been fairly steady. It's practically a straight line. Mm -hmm. And Werner, is that housing unit, is anything a housing unit, like uh, a mobile home, that would be considered a housing unit? Would a seasonal uh, only? Yeah, I mean, we don't really differentiate. Well, um, we don't differentiate in terms of the permits necessarily on, so a mobile home would qualify as a housing unit. You know, I mean, that's uh, classified as a single-family home. Right. And, you know, if somebody chooses to live in their home seasonally, I mean, that also is going to get classified as a, uh, as a dwelling unit. Mm -hmm. uh, a duplex would count for two, you know, dwelling units. Uh, you know, a multiplex, depending on the number of units in it, would each count as a dwelling unit. So it doesn't necessarily mean mm -hmm. buildings, per se. Right, just dwelling unit. Correct. And what would, um, would things like... Um, seasonal units like in Hidden Pond would yeah, they be? The same thing. Would they be? No. So uh, so or, hidden, so Hidden Pond. Well, oh, Hidden Pond is is a unique animal in the sense that the first phase of it, uh, it was originally permitted uh, through the mobile home park standards, but then was converted to hotel use. So. You, you've got a little bit of an anomaly in that when they were permitted, they were permitted as dwelling units, but then they came out of the housing, you know, I mean, not that they were really in the housing stock, but then they were no longer classified as housing units because they went through a change of use process with the planning board. Uh, since then, you know, what you have, the, you know, the detached uh, cottages in the back are all hotel units, and so they are not classified as dwelling units. And the converse, uh, 
What was the hotel called? The Resort at Goose Rocks. Um, uh, the Old Beachwood? The Old Beachwood, yep. yeah. So that was hotel. Correct. And still is, from a use perspective, still is. Uh, it's just it's under a condo form of ownership. So they're um, not new dwelling units. They are not new dwelling so, units. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Most most zoning ordinances and most building codes they they distinguish between dwelling units and those that are not by whether or not there is a kitchen inside the unit. And the idea: if you're able to cook your own meals, then you're a dwelling unit. Right, but like the old yeah. Beechwood, they took two hotel rooms <coughs> and made them one unit, and they're fully functional yeah. apartments. Right. Yeah, um, they all have they all have cooking facilities within them. Uh, the town's ordinance has an allowance that lets you have kitchen mm -hmm. uh, kitchens and hotel units, but it's specific in that it it, it limits those in terms of the occupancy times. Uh, so they can't be declared as as uh, someone's um, residence. Right. Yeah. Right. So they're not dwelling units. For this purpose? Correct. For this right. purpose, they're not yeah. dwelling units. And how about the ones in the back? They built a whole bunch of new buildings. Also not dwelling units. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So it's kind of, I'm, I'm just, you know, the... Uh, so when you look at the old Beechwood, just that, you know, as, as the example, you had numerous buildings that were there on site. And right. so overall, the number of, you know, if you want to call the number of hotel units out there remained, I want to say remained the same. Because uh, you had a pretty large building that was out there, you know, that had a large number of units in it that was torn down. Mm -hmm. And then basically that square footage and units were just split up into right. the individual cottages that, that you see out there today. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, there were always where people staying there before, and now there were roughly the same number, say, staying there now. But then they built 20 new houses in the back. I don't know what the number is. I'm making that up. Um which would seem to be part of our growth, but for the purposes yeah. of this. Yeah, they don't show up as dwelling units. So I'm just wondering, to me, I would want to know that, that in addition to, right. yeah. uh, in addition to the dwelling units, we also have, you know, I mean, yeah, those, you, those places are open six months a year. There are people who move in for six months and, you know, they just can't be there in the winter. Right. Yep, and they can't declare it as their residence. Right. Yep. Hmm. Warner, the change in the amount of dwelling units that are being built in the uh, growth area, is that the dramatic drop-off? Is that a result of build-out, or is it a result of cost, the expense of building in the growth area? Are you referring to the second chart? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what, what page are you on, the, Barbara? I'm, I'm looking at the growth permits that would... Uh, given out in 2015 and 16 versus 17, 18, mm -hmm. and yeah. 19. It's, it's, it's the, the, well, yeah, it's, it's the, right. the next. Yeah. Figure six, right. two. Yeah. <clears throat> no, it's a good question. Uh, you know, no, it's not, it's not the result of build out. Uh, so it is the cost of correct. land. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would say that, you know, uh, as a general rule, land that's within the growth area, um, you know, significantly more expensive oh, as yeah. a general rule yeah. than land that's in the uh, uh, rural and transitional. Okay. I jumped ahead, Tom. Sorry. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, next uh, next slide we got here is is the uh, the percentage growth. How fast various towns in the area are growing, and we compared Kennebunkport with with the county, but also with uh, cities and towns that are not very far away. And, and as you can see. Um, Kennebunk Port is not on either extreme. It's kind of in the middle of the pack. We're almost really out there, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. amazing. Well, it's a percentage. So um, if you have a smaller town, um, you know, one or two big subdivisions can really skew the numbers. Yeah. Then we are uh, looking at occupancy trends, and that basically is comparing... Uh, Year-round rentals, seasonal, and, and uh, um, um, year-round owner-occupied, um, owned, owner-occupied, yeah. And over the last 40 years, as you can see, is the year-round rentals have been uh, down. They're down 25% over 40 years. And the uh, seasonal um, units are growing faster than the year-round units. Now, this is not all at once. Remember, we're, we're looking at a 40-year trend, so... 
you know, yeah. uh, one thing that might be important to note on that <coughs> occupancy trend that you're, you know, what you're showing here is owner occupied year round, and I'm assuming it's a comparison between owner occupied year round and renter occupied year round. Yes. We have that on that chart you're looking at. Yeah. yeah. It just says versus renter occupied. Yeah. So maybe that it's year round yeah. renter occupied. Good point. As opposed to, yeah. gen, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times oh, folks right. just think right. of it as a seasonal. Yeah. I it's gotcha. kind of doubled up. Yeah. Okay. That, that's actually a different chart. Than, And then we uh, compared the, uh, um, the single-family homes in, in town with uh, York County, and again, there was no surprise. Um, Kennebunkport is um, predominantly single-family. Of course, when the comparison, we're, we're comparing with you know places like Biddeford, and has a lot of apartment units. What page is that? Do we or have? I don't think we have that. I don't think we have it in there. That's page it's five. It's in there, yeah. Um, is see. the chart sideways instead of? <coughs> Number of bedrooms? No. Let me go grab a copy of what you guys are looking at. Housing types and household sizes. Is <clears throat> okay. It's a, it's a vertical. Oh, okay. That's yeah. the difference. Okay. It's on the right it's side of page elevation. five. All right. All right. Different mm -hmm. colors, maybe, too? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Maybe that's me. <laughs> it is different colors, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Also, uh, when we compared uh, mm -hmm. Kennebunkport with the county, uh, again, no surprise, the, uh, the, the household size is um, a little smaller, and the uh, number of rooms tend to be a little greater. So the houses are a little bit bigger here than in the rest of the county. Populated by slightly fewer people. Energy consumption. Um, I kind of knew where this was going to go, so I threw in the other New England states. Um, Maine stands out among the six New England states in its reliance on heating oil. Which uh, page are you on? Uh, That's page six. We don't, have that. we don't have that. Or we do, it's but it's page oh, different. Where? What page? <clears throat> right side of page six. Age of right. buildings, and then... Okay, so it's, okay, all right. Okay, yeah, it does, it's this one. Figure six. six. It's just yep. dashing. Here, well, once again, it's the other way around. Oh, right. Okay. okay. And uh, Kenny Monkport uh, differs from all six states, including Maine, and its reliance also, in addition to heating oil, on um, uh, LP gas. Say that again? There's a unusually large percentage of people in town who uh, uh, use um, propane. Because there's no, there's no natural gas. We don't have right. that direct. Yeah. Whereas states with higher populations mm -hmm. or more money have. Yeah, look up on that graph that's on the screen. You can see yeah, the propane is yellow. The, road, and the brown is uh, heating right. oil. So there's, those are pretty significant differences with everybody else in New England. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I suspect over time, you know, we'll see natural gas and or the uh, yeah LP is going to increase, you know, and I'd suspect fuel oil will decrease. Yeah, and and the governor has declared that there are going to be 100,000 new heat pumps in the next five years. I'm not sure how that's going to happen, but that's the goal. The state has, I don't know whether um, they have a, I just saw it last week, they have a nice comparison on cost of all of this mm -hmm. um, in order to, it shows you that uh, firewood is the cheapest and heat pumps are the next cheapest. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a environmental impact, it just has a cost impact, mm -hmm. but it's a Firewood's nice, cheaper? firewood is the cheapest. I thought it'd be more expensive. I thought so now. too. Wow. But it's an interesting um, data they put together. Mm -hmm. How do they compare the two? How do, how do, they, how do you compare? Just BTUs. Oh, you know, BTU. for, oh okay. <clears throat> you know, house of a given size. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What it would cost to heat for a heat season. Yeah. And uh, we looked at how old the buildings were and uh, compared that with the county. 
Uh, buildings, houses in Kenny Bankport tend to be older than the rest of the county. And 60% of them were uh, constructed prior to 1980. That was of interest to me because um, it was in 1978 that the federal government outlawed uh, lead-based paint. And uh, that, that can be a problem if you live in one of those houses, particularly if you have children in the environment. So this just gives you a little snapshot of how much lead paint may be out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we looked at the assessed value of uh, dwellings in Kennebunkport. And um, this is, again, this is the uh, American Community Survey. That's a branch of the U.S. Uh, Census. And they, they're out there um, uh, doing, doing um, sampling every year. Um, they, they do the, the decennial census where they count everybody and everything every 10 years, but in the interim, they go out there and they take a smaller sample. And they said the, uh, the results were the median uh, assessed value in Kennebunk Port, which is 2018, I believe, is um, 399,000. That's quite a bit higher than the county and the state. Now, um, compared the assessed value with what you could actually sell your house for in the market, and it's quite a difference. Usually the, the assessed value is, is behind the sales price. Werner, when is the reassessment, if it, is it technically a reassessment or it's an updating? Right now? Mm -hmm. No, so what it is, it's a, so. Market uh, it's analysis. A, it's a market adjustment is what it is, specifically related to the construction cost tables. So the construction cost tables haven't been updated since since they were put in in 2009, and so those are being those are being <coughs> updated. But along with that, the depreciation tables will also be uh, will also be adjusted. So will we at the end of that, which will be later this year, will we have updated data for this, or it's not going to impact this data? Um, yeah, I mean the assessed, yeah, the assessed values would change. You know, yeah. I mean this this data would be different. Yeah, and, yeah. and you'd have a different source too, Paul. Um, when when the town does a reval, the, the assessor will have that current information. Um, we were relying on. Um, right. No. No. I realize that, Mike. So my question is, should we keep this as an open item to update later in the year when we have our local data? Yeah. Is that better data, more accurate data? It, it would be better data. It would be more comprehensive. The advantage of using the ACS is that we can compare uh, Kennebunkport with other towns and with right. the county. Right. Apples yeah. to apples. Yeah. You'll end us know when we come by so I can take all the nice stuff and hide it? Yeah, right. Yeah, get rid of the <laughs> front steps so yeah. people don't think you're actually <laughs> living there. That's right. I like that. yeah. Take out the like kitchen, it. too. Yeah. 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 Don't laugh. That's yeah. where I came from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a good old New Hampshire trick. That's right. Get rid of the front steps. You drive down the road, and you're like, why aren't the... Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. That's why they don't have the steps. Yeah. Yeah. Paint a house? What's that about? That's right. We yeah. don't want to paint the house either. Yeah. See we're, the we're... antenna on the roof and no front stairs. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta love it. I think it's worth it. Give away. Uh, this is the, also asked if you have a mortgage. Uh, you're, you're slightly <laughs> less likely to have a mortgage at Kitty Monkport than you are in the county. Not a whole lot of difference. And uh, they asked, uh, they, they try to determine the, the cost of owning your home as a percent of your income. Um, when we say cost, we're talking about uh, mortgage, if you have a mortgage, property taxes, utilities, um, general maintenance. And then this chart here on the screen um, uh, depicts what percentage of that is uh, of your income. So, you know, we've got a couple things in play here, both the, uh, the, um, the income and, and um, what, what percent it is. What's the difference between 613 and 614? The two charts on page 8. Is it possible the word without was, was missing in the <coughs> 614? Maybe that's what it is. Because it looks like it's the chart that references people without a mortgage. And it, I think without yeah. was eliminated. Okay. Yeah. Or I missed. That's right. yeah, that's the, um... So then it would make sense. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Oh, yeah. The without is missing. Yeah. Okay. Thank 
Yeah. And then we uh, took the uh, same uh, look at people who are renting as opposed to paying off mortgages. And um, based, we had different income categories and, and looked at what percentage of uh, the, the rent is consuming their, their income. Now, the, uh, the government, uh, when I say the government, housing and urban development, they typically use 30% uh, of your income as the, the benchmark for affordability. Some, some housing agencies go down to 28, but they're all in that general area. Mm -hmm. So um, the way they typically um, measure whether or not your situation is affordable is if you're paying more or less than 30% of your household income. And you can see the renters in uh, Kennebunkport, Port, um, there's quite a few of them are up above that 30%. <coughs> mm -hmm. Now, the main, uh, main housing, it used to be called the Main Housing Authority. They have what they call an affordability index where they compare your household income to your housing costs. And it's a ratio that's, in this table here, it's way over on the right, on your in front of you, it would be on page 12. 12, okay. So you can see uh, what you want to, what the ratio you want to have is is a one, a 1 1.0, because that means your your household income and your housing costs match up pretty well. Um, if your ratio is below that, it means your um, the houses in the town uh, cost a lot more than the, the median income. And what you see in this table is Kenny Monkport has one of the lower ratios. Now, it's a little tricky um, because... So are we supposed to be... At, you say that again? Oh, well, you want to be more at a one? Yeah, you want to you be at a one. It means people who are living in town can afford to live there. Um, if your ratio starts to go down below one, it means it's becoming less affordable. Now, also keep in mind that like, it's not on this table, but the town of Scarborough, for example, has, has a fairly decent affordability ratio. Um, but that's deceiving. Real estate in Scarborough is very expensive. Houses are very expensive. But so the household income is quite high. So their ratio bounces out to a one. So. Hmm. Okay. So it's kind of a tricky way to measure it, but this is how the main housing does it. So our income would be more diverse? It looks like your housing costs are, um, you know, galloping ahead of your, your income is what's going on. So bigger houses? how much of this gets skewed by, uh, you know, the demographic of retirees that, um, you know, have a maybe don't have an income necessarily anymore that aren't in the workforce. Is that a factor here uh, uh, whenever we're looking at this? Yeah, well, when, when the census asks, you know, for your household income, they're, they, you know, collecting pensions and Social Security and whatever whatever's coming in. Yeah. So, yeah, if, if you have a lot of folks in town have been here for a long time and, you know, they don't have a mortgage, um, that, that could that could explain that that uh, that index. Right, I put a lot of sweat equity in my house, and you know, my mortgage isn't as big. Maybe would I be would that bring it the opposite way? Yeah, I mean that would <coughs> you know so you know if there were more unless you guys assessed it too high. <laughs> there are more situations like yours than that number, you know, that instead of 0.47, that, that would be a higher number. It'd be closer. Yeah. It'd be closer to, to a one. Yeah. Bless you. Unless it's based on the assessed value. The assessed value yeah. would be higher. Mm -hmm. The assessed relative, value would be higher because relative the income it assumes you paid somebody. To to, yeah. 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 Correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's, it's a market. It's more of a market <clears throat> number as opposed right. to an actual and, and if you look up at the, the screen, there's a trend for the last uh, six years in your county. It's not Kenny Monkport, it's the county. Uh, you can see the affordability index is declining, which is meaning people are having a harder time affording to live here. Yeah. 
Then uh, a few years ago, the, the town hired, uh, I don't know how to say the name of this company. Can somebody help Kamoin. me? Kamoin. Kamoin? Yep. Yeah. They, they did a very uh, thorough, they called it an analysis and an assessment of um, housing affordability. And they came up, it was fairly detailed um, analysis, and then came up with a number of uh, findings, and they came up with a few recommendations. But on this screen here is a brief summary of their <coughs> many findings. And I, um, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with this. But um, I, I thought it was pretty solid. I didn't, I didn't have any uh, mm -hmm. complaints with Kamoin's um, approach or, or their findings. Now we get into what the state of Maine is uh, asking you all to do. Uh, this is a little bit different than your last comprehensive plan when you did the same analysis. Uh, eight years ago, they came up with a slightly lower number of affordable units that they were looking for. That was 23. Uh, the math comes out a little different this time. It's, um, we're, we're calculating 26 affordable units that the, um, the state expects the town to uh, provide in the next 10 years. Is that, is that, you say state law, is that in the context only of the comp plan review criteria? Is that yes. where that comes from? Yes. There isn't an independent... No, no. The, the law doesn't say bad things are going to happen to you if you don't do it, but this, if you are going to do a comprehensive plan, this is the analysis that the state requires you to do. And the last time, I know the, the last comp plan, you know, had a similar discussion and it said there was a goal of 10% or something like that? Was right. that just, um, so that number was not driven by the state, it was just? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I would say that that's typical, you know, I mean, that's supportive language. It comes from, you know, uh, state comprehensive planning documents. Yeah. It's based on if you, if you max out of your, on your growth management permit, it, the town's allowed. Yes. So if if you do issue all of your growth management permits every year, and ten percent of them are affordable, then that's about twenty-six. Right. right. So, so the the state criteria are pretty clear well, about what they call affordable. They, in this instance, they're saying eighty percent of the median income. Um, if you're able to buy a house with 80% of the median income, then, then it's, it's met the state's goal. The part I found a little uh, vague is that same criteria uh, says that the median income in the region. And of course, what's the region? That's, that was the first question I asked. Mm -hmm. And whenever state government <coughs> uses words like that, and they're not very precise. Right. Right. I always interpret that to mean <coughs> we can kind of go this way or that way, you know, just so long as we're reasonable. Yeah, I mean, in this, you know, in the, in the Ports case, I mean, a similar market could be <coughs> could be limited to, you know, strictly coastal, yeah, yeah, uh, I mean, coastal I areas. I don't think it's fair to make us look bad if you can go out to Dayton or someplace out west and buy a hundred acres for like the price you could buy an acre here or something. I know that's uh, right. You're not comparing you apples to apples. How do you compare that? Right. It's not. Well, you know, if your zoning out there only allows you know, five acres to a house, then in effect it's keeping, you know, affordable. It's, it's, a, it's impacting affordability um, by having such a large development requirement. Right. I, I just So that, you can compare. I think there's a lot more variables. Yeah, you can you buy know, land you, cheaper you in can, Oxford can, County than... Yeah, you can, like, yeah. <clears throat> So another thing the town of Canyon Port did was uh, four years ago they uh, were host to the uh, Workforce Housing Coalition of the Greater Seacoast, and uh, oh, yeah. this organization volunteers did a uh, a charrette, and uh, they um, well, I wasn't there, but from what I understand, they uh, the goal was to uh, see if they could build a dwelling for two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars, and they spent a few days uh, and they looked at two sites. 
And I know, Werner, I saw your pictures in the material, so I know you, you were there, and you know exactly As what were many of us. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, from what I can read from the record is uh, they were uh, successful in the so-called urban site, and they, were they did not meet that goal in the rural site. Um, but uh, they, they also had a, a zoning bonus, which I understand was hypothetical, that it doesn't actually exist in your ordinance, but they said if it was there, this is what we could do. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. Blocked the <coughs> amount of those days out. <laughs> but the, di the difference between, the difference with sewer between That's rural right. and yeah. Yeah, urban. Yeah, I mean, the big difference, yeah. right, you know, in and terms of the two sites. there was a density bonus. Right. It could not be done with the current zoning. Correct. Right. But right. if zoning were by spot zoning or rezoning, yeah. Um, it could have been done. Right. Yeah. I mean, site constraints were, you know, were a, were a big factor, you know, in looking at the two, you know, and, and the two hypotheticals. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, one assumed, you know, a sewer and water access, and, you know, the other one didn't. So yeah. it made a big difference. Yeah. But the decision was they'd rather have a sewer plant. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. Well, that was just a hypothetical site. Right. <laughs> it was a perplexing discussion. Short-term rentals, another issue that's oh, caught yeah. the popular imagination in town. Uh, so much so that the selectmen appointed an ad hoc committee to look into it. And the uh, committee issued a survey. They got quite a few responses, over 800. Um, and they posed a few questions. Um, one of them is, you know, is this short-term rentals, are they causing a nuisance? Uh, they, they undermine the town's sense of community. Are they driving up the, um, you know, rent? Are they, they decreasing the uh, stock of rental units? And, uh, which, oh, did I get ahead of myself here? Anyways, the, uh, the big question, though, was should the town uh, regulate short-term mm -hmm. rentals and the town... Um, split pretty much right down the middle, which isn't really a mandate to go anywhere. <laughs> Thank God. And uh, these are uh, some of the, the uh, strategies that were considered in the 2012 comprehensive plan. And uh, there are also, some of them are reiterated by Camp Hoyne. Um, Cluster development, um, reducing the uh, minimum lot and frontage requirements, uh, increased density. Some of these seem like, oh yeah, that's kind of obvious, but then when you try to implement it, that's when things get interesting. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, and they identified a, a need for uh, some of the older residents who were living in big houses, and they'd be perfectly happy in a smaller place, but there just aren't that many uh, available in town. Uh, another strategy they recommended was um, provide a subsidy in the form of uh, free land from the town. Um, reducing off-street parking requirements. I'm not sure, is that, is that really uh, a major driver here in town? or? I know it is in some of the larger towns and cities, but um, not, re not yeah. really. Not really. Was this, was this uh, strictly for housing? Yeah, you, you, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. We, you know, housing. Liz and I were working in in Saco, and it was pretty obvious in Saco that that was a classic example of you know the parking requirement would cause an apartment in the center of the city to cost more, and you know the obvious thing was well, like, you know, do something about the parking requirement, you know. Right. Uh, so that makes sense when you're in an urban setting, but uh, I'm not sure why Camp Wayne was throwing that out here because I don't see that much of an issue here. Just because the town is more more yeah, rural. Yeah, I mean, based yeah. on the you know, if you're looking at the multiplex standards, you know, mm -hmm. and looking at the minimum you know lot size per unit that's mm -hmm. there, I mean, it doesn't. I mean, it creates a large lot, you know, to do yeah. a multiplex. Right. And it doesn't really lend itself to having a parking issue. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're looking at essentially two spaces per dwelling unit. Yeah. Um, you know, the, some of the designs that we'd seen were basically you had enough for a driveway and a one-car garage, and that satisfied mm -hmm. the parking requirements that yeah. way. Yeah. But, 
Yeah, so I, I didn't think that was terribly applicable to, to this particular setting. Same with the last um, recommendation they made is diaper floors and building. That's more of a, a Sackle Biddeford type recommendation. Sure. Yeah. yeah. But no, I, I agree with you. If it, if it was, you know, if you had a lot more, you know, development in a dense, you know, in yeah. a dense urban setting, then it makes oh. perfect sense. That yeah, that's, it, it's a know, real killer in cities, but I don't think it's, it's terribly issue. relevant here. Yeah, it was discussed in the context of the village parcel if there were going to be right. uh, some dense, denser development, uh, would there be mixed use and mm -hmm. residential upstairs? <coughs> um, While we're on the topic, um, has the town floated the idea of adjusting the minimum lot size, frontage requirements, and density? Is that have you guys tried that? For so there's two questions. Has yeah. it been discussed and have we tried it yet? <laughs> okay, let's do one at a time. How did the discussion go? <laughs> so discussion, I think, you know, has happened, you know, amongst, you know, growth planning for years, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's been, you know, it's something that's generally been um, suggested, uh, you know, in the comp plan. Yeah. But has it actually, you know, been put forward, you know, in a, in a, in a zoning amendment? No. <coughs> yeah. Okay. You talk about um, the minimum size lines. Correct. Yeah, yeah. lot yeah. size yeah. and yeah. frontage, but I think it should be. A, it's a good topic for public discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, because when people make the connection between expense, yes, and why there isn't development, and you know, when I'm, I'm looking at that list of all different things, campaign um, recommended the ones that to me that seem so um, most accessible, the ones that you could actually do without costing a lot of money. Uh, would, would be zoning adjustments yeah. too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it's one of those, uh, you know, uh, I think relatively logical moves for those areas that have access to sewer and water, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that there be an adjustment in terms of lot size if there's, if there's direct access to, you know, uh, those types of facilities. Because um, otherwise, even if, you know, if you were, you know, dealing with, um, you know, with a septic site, you still have to meet state minimum standards of half yeah. acre. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you can't go much lower than that okay. in terms of the density, just dealing with subsurface waste rules. Right. Yeah. And when the, the sites are crap, you know, if they're all rock, uh, yeah. it becomes more of a problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You may need more than. Yeah. Of course, it does make all of Goose Rocks non-conforming, which I think is lovely. It looks, it almost looks, when you look at the land use ordinance, it almost looks like a rubber stamp. 40, 40, 40. <laughs> is there no change in this right. town? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the irony of it is, is that the, you know, the, you know, the lot standards in the, in the ordinance wouldn't allow for the recreation of the community that you have. Yeah. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. So the minimum size state, the minimum size lot is a half acre? When you're dealing with septic, septic. Yeah, really? you've got to have minimum 20,000 square foot mm. lot. So if yes, you're sir. carving out, so if you were in a town that didn't have any zoning uh, whatsoever in terms of minimum lot size, you'd still have to have 20,000 square feet uh, between, just because when you when you start applying the the uh, well and septic yeah, yeah. Oh, separations. You be, yeah, you got to be certain, yeah. Distance, yeah, yeah, practically right. speaking, you need, you know, 20,000 square yeah. feet to make that work. But when you're on the sewer, you can do all kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, I said, I don't know, what was it, two years ago, I said, yeah, if you want to reduce the building envelope, you reduce the, the cost of what it is, and even the resale value, per se, depending, unless you're on the ocean or whatever, but strategy, I'd, I'd be in favor of talking about. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, as an outsider, you know, the, my first impression is that the, that the value of land is the, the biggest driver in, you know, mm -hmm. cost of housing here. Mm -hmm. So if you if you if you want to look at density and lot size adjustments, you know that could affect the uh, the value. And I I would think the sewer should be part of that discussion. What is the capacity? Where is it? Yes. Um, yeah. Is there opportunity for, you know, can you increase the, you know, lines where mm -hmm. right. all of that. All right. Well, uh, we haven't, uh, you know, in, in, in the coming months we'll be engaged in the public. We'll have a right. charrette and we'll have other public engagement events. And um, what I'm hearing is you guys are up for having that discussion again at that time. Yeah. Huh? Absolutely. Yeah. So just two things I note on, on page 15, just the boxes that are, uh, yeah, that are there. Floating. So, yeah, the Camoyne recommendations, that one looks like it's... <coughs> oh. 
It's been a different version. Pulled, pulled forward over some of the text. Fine, but... Yeah. And then the oh, and then the gray box. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the one I printed out was fine yes. from the draft. Oh yeah. yeah. The one that was attached to the agenda was fine, but this one's different. Okay. So I don't know. Maybe you tweaked it. Um. Yeah, it, nice. when you go to different computer systems, sometimes Microsoft does weird stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Did you set your margins to two inch? No. Inch and a half, half inch over here? Right. I didn't even touch it. <laughs> you no. didn't touch it? <laughs> I didn't mess with it. Uh, yeah, it's on page 15. Yeah. 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 Ours looks normal, but... Oh, okay, yeah. so... <laughs> Just a weird one. Uh, so here are three other uh, definite recommendations that didn't fit on the last slide. Um, once again, it's... Well, the first one, of course, is you're, you're trying to subsidize the operation by making the land cost less. Then there's tax increment <coughs> financing, TIF districts. You're all familiar with those? Mm -hmm. yeah. That was another yes, one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, we don't have any here in town, mm -hmm. but, you know, but it's a... Well, the state's put it out there is uh, one, one tool if you're interested in pursuing it. Yeah. Then we have a, what I can, what I can gather is a, a new group in town, Kenny Bunkport Heritage Housing Trust. Yeah. Um, their goal is to build 25 affordable homes in the next five years. Where and I saw your photograph in that group as well. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Looks like you got off to a good start. You got any update for us? Yeah. So, uh, so the Housing Trust has submitted uh, a planning board application for its first subdivision. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're looking at six units there. So it'll be a mix of uh, singles and duplexes over on the, um, the old uh, skating rink site. Mm -hmm. So. So yeah, so we'll be in front of the planning board here shortly with oh, that. Good. Great. So, um, it's a site that uh, it'll, it, so it's kind of a mix in terms of the infrastructure. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a mix of um, uh, town water and septic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, town sewer doesn't run anywhere, you know, uh, close by, but uh, the town water is available, unfortunately, on the other side of the street. So, but, <laughs> so we've got some challenges there. But. Numbers add up? To some degree, yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, even you know, even with you know, even with the land, um, you know, being a being a tax acquired piece that the board of selectmen uh, gave to the housing trust, you know, there's still challenges, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of making making the units affordable. Yeah. You know, even just you know, just dealing <coughs> with the site constraints and the development costs, and mm -hmm. you know, I mean, these homes are you know, they're they're uh, they're going to be modular, you know, modular construction and you know they have some efficiency upgrades to them, but you know, um, you know, but we're still, you know, still struggling to get them into the, you know, keep them in the affordability range. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so, good luck with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. but now so we're moving moving ahead, and like I said, it'll be in front of the planning board here uh, within the next month, I believe. Great. Should All we right. mention Habitat's efforts in town? Um, they've built one house in the past three years, and they're. I just saw they yep. they have two more um, slated. Yeah, yeah, two more in Cape Corpus. In next, yeah. yeah, in the next year we. Yeah, no, that's a good point, Paul. I, I was not those. aware they were active so. here. Yeah, I just got a. Okay. Someone donated some land, mm -hmm. apparently. Is that the red house, the, down on Cape Corpus. You guys, you go down toward the roads. It's it's oh, it's near. Uh, Don't. It's on uh, Mills off of yeah, Mills, Mills Road. Road. Uh, Mills Road and Cape Corpus. Yeah, there's a. Uh, they said I can go get the the flowers and stuff before the excavator comes in and takes the house. So oh, I want the tiger lilies. <laughs> Don't do it until you get the assessment worked out. What's that? I said. That's right. You wait till after the assessment. Put, you put those flowers in front of your house. And, you know. Those Are going to my rental. <laughs> so, it's free free uh, landscape. <laughs> All right. Uh, as you know, your uh, your comprehensive plan uh, should be consistent with the state's <coughs> goals, analyses, objectives, and strategies. The state has one overarching goal in terms of housing. It's 
to encourage and promote affordable, decent housing for all citizens. And this is part of the uh, the analysis that uh, you're required to, to run uh, in order to respond to those those goals. And uh, eight were the eight per year was the number we came up with based on the uh, the demographic uh, uh, analysis and the um, demographics chapter we saw last month. That's eight per year. Um, for five years? Is that what the, the time frame you're talking about? The planning no, period. The planning period would be 10 years. years. Yeah. Based just on projected, yeah. projected population growth. Yeah. yeah. What? Not the housing start number that you came up with, no. 25. No. No. No, this is a, the state also has some population projections, so we use that as our oh, I see. reference. Yeah. This housing, including rental housing, affordable those earning the median income in the region. We, we saw that it's not at the moment. Uh, is housing affordable those earning 80% of the median income? Again, it's no. And the uh, state tells us if not, and it's not, review local and regional efforts to address the issue. That's what we were talking about a few minutes ago. And we'll be doing that some more when we, uh, we um, engage the public in the summer. Are seasonal homes being converted to year-round use or vice versa? What impact does this have on the community? Uh, well, we down to the survey to find out. <laughs> the opinions were all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Will additional low and moderate income family senior assisted living housing be necessary to meet projected needs for the community? Um, yes and yes. You know, the, uh, as we mentioned earlier, there are, there are elderly people who are looking to downsize, and then the, uh, the enrollment at the elementary school is a little shaky because uh, there's a um, certain demographic cohort in town that ordinarily are producing young families. There, there are just not that many of them in town recently. One thing that I hope we would discuss is... Um, when we do the public outreach is um, rental versus purchase. I know the housing trust is, at least in the initial group, are purchase properties, but um, it seems to me in terms of trying to bring in um, families, young families, starter homes, um, I can't think of a single person I ever grew up with or went to college with or worked with who didn't rent before they owned and yes. often if you rent in a community you're likely to and then the kids come along you're likely to you know as your means improve um, and you have some savings you buy a house or buy an apartment yeah. or buy whatever so that's you know what rental stock year-round rental stock we had has gone has evaporated is evaporating it's gone down yeah and it seems to me if uh, the community is looking to bring new families in, rental is one way. And it's also, uh, you know, for seniors who need to cash out of their homes and don't want to invest in a house or can't afford to invest because they have a limited amount mm -hmm. of, you know, they have a fixed pie to live off of, um, you know, they need rental too. Yeah, and, and they're tired of maintaining a big house. Right. Right, but they don't necessarily yeah. want to take the money out of yeah. their yeah. house and buy another property. They need yeah. that money to live off of for the yeah. next. Mm -hmm. And rental is obvious choice other than yeah. a second more, I mean, a reverse mortgage, which. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an appropriate discussion to. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, next up for uh, our required analysis. <coughs> Are there other major housing issues in the community, such as substandard housing? I'm not aware of any, other than short-term rentals, which is a lively uh, discussion point. How do existing I, local? Oh, yep. Some people Jim. do have a positive outlook on. I'm just. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean. I I I I don't want to put a negative. 
We should word that differently. I, I personally, I'm one in favor of that I think mm-hmm. it allows people to be self-reliant. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't know. Plus, I just want to put that in there. Plus, you know, we're from Goose Rocks, and <laughs> there are 450 houses there, and probably half of them are rented and have always been rented. Um, there are fewer rental houses than there were 25 years ago as uh, people have bought houses and fixed them up. They tend not to rent them out as much as mm-hmm. because they're being bought by more affluent. They're not... You know, mm-hmm. the cottage shacks that used to exist uh, 50 mm-hmm. years ago or 75 years ago. Yeah. yeah to go on to, to what you were saying about young families, too, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of, you know, we didn't do it, but I'm sure there's a lot of young families that that's how they actually pay for it. You know, you can have this house, you can have this opportunity, but you subsidize it through a rent or whatever. Sure, you move in with grandma exactly. in the summertime. Exactly. And <laughs> you move back into the house. Yeah. yeah. All right, so we'll find some more diplomatic language for the answer Thank to number you. five. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's tough to really put a you know to put a number in, on that because it's you know the trends haven't really been established. I mean, it certainly is a topic that folks are much more aware of. Just mm-hmm. with you know with the advent of Airbnb and VRBO, it's out there. You know, now everybody mm-hmm. is much more. You know, I think much more hypersensitive and aware to it than, you know, than previously. And I think that was one of the challenges that, you know, in that community that we had is that, so what are we, what are we comparing? Where's our data? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, how do we know that, you know, the numbers have increased? We can't say that for sure because we don't have, well, we don't have trend data to show that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I think one thing we could say is that there were probably more short-term rentals in areas of town where there were never short-term rentals before. Yeah, that's, um, that's what tipped the scale. 25 years ago, you would rent a house at Goose Rocks right. or in yeah. Arundel or maybe Cape Porpoise. Cape now Cape you can rent a house anywhere in town. Yeah, yeah. yeah locations uh, have shifted. Locations yes. have shifted. Yeah. So that's, that's what I think yeah. has caused... Yeah, uh, it is. That's the driving force. Well, the duration, too, of the turnover of people coming. <coughs> right, three yeah, nights. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, I happen to be on a mailing list for the um, American Planning Association, Northern New England chapter. Just two days ago, they they sent out. You're on the list too, Werner. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> they they sent out a, a, a an inquiry. They says, "All you planners out there, can you tell us how your cities and towns are responding to short-term rentals?" Right. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. So have you submitted a response yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's right at the top of his desk, though. So next up, how do existing local regulations encourage or discourage the development of affordable workforce housing? This is a conversation we had a few minutes ago. Yeah. We, we know that restrictive yeah. zoning makes the house cost more. And then the, uh, the state helpfully tells us the data we have to collect in order to uh, make these analyses. Uh, I can tell you that we've, we have done everything on this list. Um, one thing on the, the third one there, yeah. summary of local regulations that uh, affect development of affordable workforce housing. I think it would be worthwhile in that to um, like look at Nantucket, which has done a lot over the years to try to provide affordable housing and to see what they've done to their zoning. Mm-hmm. There may be a couple of other towns, and you okay. know, there's one yeah. or two in Maine yeah. that have been at this for a long time, and you know, what have they done to, uh, you know, <coughs> is it just that They've gotten donations of land, or have they changed their zoning to? Okay, we will we will look into Nantucket, Paul. Any other towns in Maine that you think are worth looking at, or Bar Harbor? What's Bar-Harbor. the other one? Yeah, yeah. Harbor. Right. I mean, when so when the housing trust was being established, mm-hmm. we looked um, primarily at the uh, Island Housing Trust. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, That's right. Mm-hmm. You know, as kind of a model. Um, you know. Yeah. 
we didn't necessarily get Hi. into Hi. seeing Hi. how Hi. you know seeing how their developments uh, related to local zoning, um, but I suspect they're well. I should say, I mean, the developments that we looked at didn't necessarily strike me as anything out of the ordinary that were, you know, that looked significantly different, you know, in terms of size and density. I mean, they all fit within, you know, what the development around them looked like, but mm -hmm. but there could be some allowances that, you know, the Bar Harbor had. Mm -hmm. We'll look into that. And here are the minimum policies required to address the state goal. Encourage and promote adequate workforce housing. Ensure that our land use controls encourage the development of quality affordable housing, including rentals. Encourage and support the efforts of the regional housing coalitions in addressing affordable and workforce housing needs. <coughs> Any comments on this one? Mm -hmm. We'll get into strategies then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and these are the strategies that are recommended by uh, by the state in Chapter Two Hundred Eight. And this mm -hmm. this these are the, uh, the issues we were talking about a few minutes ago, and that's what we'll be uh, kicking around this summer. Next strategy, accessory apartments. How's that been received in town so far? Yeah, I mean, you know, we issue, you know, not a significant number of permits relative mm -hmm. uh, to accessory apartments. But, um, you know, it is, um, I, I will say, <coughs> it does sometimes come as a shock to folks whenever they, you know, whenever they're told that accessories are restricted to be, uh, to be rentals for someone's principal residence, mm -hmm. uh, that always seems to be come as a bit of a shock to folks because mm -hmm. a lot of them come at it from the initial approach of wanting to do it as a short-term rental. Mm -hmm. right. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's a family member. Yeah. What if we did it as a seasonal? You know, requiring something between short-term rental and uh, year-round. Yeah, you know? I mean, just the, you know, the occupancy, I think it gets called out as at least six months out of the year, you know, in terms of to, to declare it as a, you know, to declare it as a year as someone's principal. Right. I mean, you know, whenever we, whenever we tweak the, um, the accessory apartment regs, remember that, you know, we went from you know, we went from only allowing it right. within a house that had been built prior to 1972 and going through a zoning board of appeals right. process uh, to, you know, allowing them in detached structures and, you know, allowing them... Anywhere course, in town except anywhere, Shoreland. Yeah, anywhere in town like, yeah, except Shoreland Zone. So, um, you know, it was a significant change, um, you know, in terms of the allowances there. Werner, as I recall, and I don't have the zoning in front of me, isn't that there's a minimum square um, living area? Yeah. 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 Is that yeah. has that been kicked around? You guys thought about tweaking that? Uh, as far as like increasing it or decreasing, decreasing. decreasing it? Decreasing it. Decreasing yeah. Decreasing it. Yeah. In the era of tiny houses, why <laughs> yeah. not? Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, so I, it, tiny houses are, are a question that we get on a regular basis, okay. and um, you know, I mean, it, it is. It is interesting, you know, the accessory apartment unit size um, is still, I mean, generally speaking, the minimums, you know, I mean, fairly generous. I think we're 600 square feet um, for mm -hmm. an accessory, minimum square footage for an accessory unit, and a max of eight, of 800 square feet to so still can, call it as an accessory. Two bedrooms? Hmm? That could be maybe two bedrooms? Yeah, I'd give you two yeah. bedrooms. Yeah, and, um, and what are we on uh, a dwelling unit? What is minimum it? dwelling unit yeah. size? So is that just in general yeah. minimum, or as it relates to being able to have an accessory apartment? No, just in just in, in general. In general. So here, here's the yeah. So here's the fun fact. 
<laughs> we actually don't have, we don't have a minimum dwelling unit size. Um, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah that's I mean, what I you thought can, too. So arguably, you could, if you wanted to build a tiny home, you could build a tiny home. And you could have um, a six hundred foot accessory dwelling attached to it. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, no. <laughs> well, the, the, the flip side of it is that for uh, for accessory. To be eligible for the accessory, I think you have to have a minimum of 1,425, I think is what the number is, um, for the principal. Mm -hmm. So you get yeah, a little over 1,400 square feet for the principal, and then that 600 translates into like 40% of the dwelling unit space. Mm -hmm. So the intent is, is that you have an actual legit accessory or subordinate unit to the principal. Mm -hmm. The 600 That's is included ratio. in the 1,400? Yeah. No, no, the 1400 is, you know, is the primary, okay. you know, is the primary residence, uh, and then... So why do we do that? What's the logic behind that? Well, the logic behind... Why wouldn't, if, you know, if someone wanted to uh, bring in an affordable property yep. and build themselves a more compact space and then have an accessory space, and that's the way they were going to afford it, yep. um, why would we care... Uh, that their own unit wasn't 600 square feet. Yeah, you'd classify you know. it as a duplex then. You know, get classified as a, as a two-family. But you can't set... And you've got a minimum unit size, I think it's 650 on the duplex. On a duplex? Yeah, on a duplex. Right. Mm -hmm. Paul, Paul raises an interesting question. You know, when I see these minimum um, sizes, I, yeah. I think there's a lot of history there. It goes back 100 years. And, and you know, 100 years ago in places like the Lower East Side in New York City, right. they, were, they were crammed in. 30, 30 people in. on a... And, and, and so the government said, well, you know, in order to prevent that from happening, we've got to enact these minimum sure. yeah, areas. Sizes, you know? yep. So at the time, it made perfect sense. I'm wondering if it makes sense in 2020 in, in you know, a small town on the main coast. Yeah. You know? yeah, I mean, when you ask what the logic is, I mean, I don't know that there necessarily was a particular logic on the square footage size, other than it was probably looking at what was already on the books you know, in terms of unit sizes and, you know, and modifying it based on what people's comfort level was. Uh, I mean, but it probably grew out of that standardization. Yeah. Yeah. It requires that the accessory dwelling isn't, like, more than 30% of the area of the whole property. But if you don't have, that's not the exact number, but if you don't have that minimum, if you don't have the minimum um, dwelling unit size of your primary residence and then you add a 600 um, square foot accessory apartment on, then the accessory apartment had would be over a greater percentage of the, 50%. the building. The building envelope compared to the size of the sure. lot. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. Just yeah. the the size of the principal versus the accessory. Yeah. Right. Yeah, at that point, it's not an accessory anymore. And I think yeah. that's what the, yeah. <laughs> the differentiation in the numbers was, is that, you know, you had one that was a principal and one that was accessory. Yeah, so so I, I think the origins of this particular type of regulations were intend to address public health, and I'm, I'm wondering if that's really something you need to really worry yeah, about Yeah, I don't know here. if that one was public health. I think yeah. that was just comfort level, <laughs> you know, I think. I mean, 100 yeah. years ago what it was is, you know, they were just cramming so many people into small spaces. Mm -hmm. but. Right. I mean, yeah, I'm, and, I'd be in favor of if it allows younger people to have a primary and, and sub subsidize. Well, Werner's saying, saying, well, you could have a duplex then. Yeah, if you wanted it just, to, it's under our as current... A, as a duplex. Now, what I do think is is worthy of looking at are, are going to be the setback, the setback requirements for duplexes. You know, I mean, right now in the books we have a 40-foot front setback and 20-foot side, side and rear setbacks for duplexes, which, um, practically speaking, it just, there's no, it's arbitrary, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of what, you know, I'm not sure what drove those numbers to show up in the in the ordinance. Well, that's a um, blueprint for suburbia. Right. Yeah. So. And in some parts of town, if you're a public water and public sewer, maybe suburbia is not the best model. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't disagree with that. You know, it's just that's what that's what was that's what's been on the books. You know, for duplexes since they've been allowed here. Um, same thing when you look at multiplexes. I mean, you have you've got a significantly larger setback as it relates to multiplexes, um, at least in the in a performance standard for multiplexes, there's some semblance of logic to it. You know, it gives some discussion relative to, uh, you know, allowances for movement of 
fire apparatus between units and things like that. So there's mm -hmm. there's some more defined logic that's there, but you know, but I think that you know, instead of just having a blanket number of you need to have X, you know, the regs could be adjusted such that you give some you know, you give some allowance to whoever's doing the design that addresses those, pu you know, the public safety issues. Um, you know, we're not we're not cramming a, a you know a ladder truck in between you know in the side yards between um, you know between two multiplexes. I mean, that's just not practically that's not happening. Um, especially since you know I suspect um, you know that language may have been you know in there before sprinklers were. Written. Sure. So, you know, so and that's you have, a trade-off. So right. you have right. You've got some zoning that you know that was probably in place and just hasn't kept you know hasn't yeah. kept pace with mm -hmm. performance so it would, standards. It would seem like it would be a good discussion to have. Now's our chance. Sure. Yep. As yeah. we uh, are planning no, for the next ten as years. A strategy. I mean, that should all get looked at. Right. You yeah. know, I mean, those performance standards and, and the regs should be looked at. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very great. I think it'd be a good idea. Then we'll maybe not for the whole town, but maybe their, you know, areas near the sewer. Intent. Yeah, the intent is there, and, and it's a purpose for to try yeah, to create yeah. affordable housing. And, and it's right, given 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 the magnitude of the problem. Yeah, put it right. on the table, and and, and you and you do have parts of town where there is no forty foot setback from the road too. You know, I mean, Dock Square for one. Mm -hmm. Sure, the yeah. whole village yeah. concept. Next strategy up. Creator, continue to support a community and affordable workforce <coughs> housing committee. It sounds an awful lot like the Kenny Bunk Heritage Housing Trust. Okay. Designate a location in growth areas where mobile home parks are allowed. Any controversy here? Uh, honestly, oh, yeah. I'd rather see an accessory apartment than a like yep. than just have the density of a bunch of clustered houses. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just me. Mm -hmm. I think it's it fits. I think it fit, it fits. Yeah. fits. Uh, it fits our community better. But mm -hmm. refresh my memory. What's the difference between a mobile home park and a manufactured housing? Well, the manufactured housing can be uh, um, standalone on its own lot. Where the mobile home park is, you know, one after another on the same property. Yeah, I mean, yeah, years yeah. ago you had, you know, uh, from what I understand, that you know, there was a push to, you know, communities were trying to outzone manufactured housing just uh -huh. as a, you know, as a construction type. Um, yeah. You know, they didn't want, you know, they didn't want HUD, uh, HUD standard homes uh, mm -hmm. in their town. And so the state law came in saying, no, nope, you can't really do that. You know, if you, wherever you allow for single family homes, you've got to allow for manufactured sure. housing. Which we presently you know. do, I assume. That's correct, right. yes. Right. Um, then, you know, then communities tried to go, you know, go the route of, um, you know, of essentially out zoning mobile home parks um, as a use. And then the state then turned around and came back and says, well, no, you can't do that. Uh, and in addition to saying that you can't do that, you also can't just zone it in, the, in obscure areas of town that, you know, that there's no reasonable chance that anyone could, uh, uh, could put in a mobile home park. Right. So uh, I s suspect that's why there's that language mm -hmm. there relative to growth areas. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, basically the state came in and said you've got to allow for these, um, you know, for a park <coughs> in places where they could actually reasonably be built so and Warner my understanding is that the current zoning ordinance complies with this right correct mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. next strategy support the efforts of local and regional housing coalitions that would be like the seacoast workforce housing which you've, you've done <laughs> yes had a charrette <laughs> yes, we. They supported us. We supported them. Right. There's a plaque to show for it. <laughs> and here's this: to seek to achieve a level at least 10 percent of new residential development built or placed during the next decade affordable. So there's another goal mm -hmm. the state would like you to uh, to chase after. 
I mean, there could be more. There's there could be more work specifically put into that. You know, I mean, it's you know, while while it's good to have the housing trust as an entity that started up. I mean, realistically, they're brand new and they've just started up. And right. So it's going to take some time for them. Mm-hmm. You know, as a as an organization to figure out you know how things are going to work. Uh, and we have nothing. We've missed thirty years of subdivisions where we could have taken ten thousand dollars a unit right. for affordable housing Correct. and we've missed that yep. Yep. that chance and we could have done it probably pretty easily right um yep. but that is a strategy going forward we could right. there are still going to be expensive houses built in town correct yep. and we could subsidize as a strategy correct yep, yep. it would just be maybe five square feet less of granite countertop Which brings us to the final slide, the key issues. Affordability for young (coughs) families so that the uh, school will grow and thrive, or at least maintain their present enrollment. Um, Decline in the number of year-round rentals. We saw over the last 40 years it's declined by 25%. Uh, More options for older adults who want to downsize, short-term rentals, um, and uh, most homes are heated with fossil fuels, but the uh, state of Maine is going to try to change that in the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. Okay. Any other key issues that are, didn't make the list here? We probably need to tie this information into what the school district is doing. They're giving a report on Thursday night to the Board of Selectmen. Okay. Um, I know they've, the, you know, they've already, uh, I haven't closely followed it, but I think we need to somehow gain that intelligent mm-hmm. intelligence, acknowledge it, and then integrate it. Okay. Because we can't be on one track and not, they have the power in the building and the... Right, right. During, during our last, because it's a regional school, yeah, it's not the towns. At our, at our, was it last month or last meeting, we were uh, talking about demographics, and I was in communication with the uh, folks in the district, so... For that chapter, our, our, our numbers are fairly current. <coughs> so they're giving the meetings at 6 o'clock on Thursday. I'm not going to – I'm going to watch it afterwards. Okay. But they're giving a report on where they are on, okay. um, sounds, I think, our school and the future of our school. It sounds like they'll have something in writing they could share with us the next yeah. day then. Huh? Any other questions, comments about uh, housing? Nope. Anyone? No. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Very, sure. Thanks, Tom. very helpful. Very well the um, next item is to look at the introduction to the climate change draft. It's a two pager. Those of you at home who are watching could go to our agenda on the website, and uh, you could click and you'd find this. I did. Thank you for the public service announcement. So, um, <clears throat> Todd, maybe a couple meetings ago, went over um, a portion of the introduction chapter, and we mentioned that we're going to be incorporating some um, climate change information into that first chapter so that um, readers have an idea of the data sources that we're using and an overall picture of what the trends are and projections are. Um, so this two pager is kind of a work in progress. The colors are I, a little bit frightening right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be cleaning that up, but um, <laughs> but we wanted to get. Um, and I don't know if I can get the whole thing on the screen. Tom, can I do full screen with this or not? Uh, I don't see why not. I mean, how do I do it? A little green thing up the top there. Right oh, there. okay. That? Perfect, you thank you. Yeah. Um, so this first page um, has some information from um, a few of um, what I think are probably the best local and regional sources um, for climate-related data um, that is available um, for uh, this area. And um, it's organized into temperature, precipitation, sea level rise, um, 
and designed to give someone just a quick understanding <coughs> of what some of the trends are um, over the next mid to um, mid century to 2100. So I'm not going to read through all the um, statistics in here, um, but I would welcome any feedback, um, questions, if there's a particular bullet point that you may have had to read a couple times in order to understand, um, um, let me know that, that feedback. Um, we want this to be sort of a quick and easy way for people to get an idea of what, um, what the science says. And then the second page shows sort of what some of the, um, how this is connected to, to comprehensive planning, why we're thinking about all these issues. Um, and so um, what we've done is, is included the temperature, precipitation, sea level rise on the top, um, and then some of the impacts that um, are going to occur, um, climatic impacts, and then the impacts to um, infrastructure, people, communities, society. Um, so if you see something in here, if you see something that's missing, if you're, there's a particular um, kind of topic that you would like to see kind of integrated and woven into this flow chart, um, we'll gladly include that. Um, but it's designed to give the reader an idea of what, um, how widespread some of the impacts are um, of these different uh, climate change impacts. So I was wondering about, um, <coughs> in looking at both of them, the increase in precipitation yep. um, and um, obviously part of that is coming in extreme precipitation events, mm -hmm. um, which means it's not hanging around, it's washing, it's, you know, it's not being absorbed by the land, it's going out the river, it's going right into the ocean, uh, depending upon what time of year it is. Mm -hmm. um, and the, and the um, heat and drought, the notions of heat and drought that are also predicted. Um, and how does that sort of, in New England, how is that reconciled? We're going to have, um, you know, more water and yet our drought, event, our drought events are going to increase as well? We're going to have um, more water in specific storm events and more water in different seasons than others, than past trends. Um, Tom, jump in if you want to. Um, if you go to a microphone. There, there yeah. also is, um, there is also projected increase in um, prolonged drought periods, so the time in between precipitation events. Do you want to add something? No, Liz basically got it. Um, but, but think of it okay. this way. You're going to get a, a, <laughs> some extreme precipitation in the winter and the spring. And, and there's a lot of evidence now coming in that there will be some severe droughts in the summer and the fall. And they could be lengthy. Um, this is kind of mind-blowing, just the complexity of the page two. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do it better, um, uh, but it's, um, it's tough. Obviously, it's a very complex mm -hmm. um, set of um, facts and circumstances and science you're trying to put together into... That's why they call it comprehensive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I know. It looks like, kind of like a crazy subway map. It <laughs> does look like a subway map <laughs> to Paris <laughs> or something. MBTA, your brain. Um, <laughs> if if the colors were different for, would that help graphically? You know, like if the temperature colors, the lines going down, if they were. But some of these, you know, some of the. They you know, go across. Some of the effects yeah, they, cross. They yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, I can make the t I can make the colors different from, um, like, to a certain extent. And no. I, I thought about doing that, but there, 
but they're all it, pretty like interconnected. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it so, would just complicate the whole thing. It might. Yeah. Like, yeah. It might. Um, right. But I think changing some of the coloring in here can help. Um, and I'll play around a little bit more with sort of the display. But part of it is that it is a really complex issue, and everything right. is very sort of interconnected. interconnected. Right. And yep. And I think one of the points that I was hoping to convey is that a lot of um, a lot of these sort of topics that are in the boxes are going to be impacted in multiple different ways sure. by different aspects Positive, of climate negative. change. Um, so I think that's kind of like a, a key thing to yeah. um, to look at. But um, maybe adding in a key or some sort of like directions of how to read it might might help. Uh, I think most people would figure it out and not stand alone issues. Right. So. I think you just got to run your finger down. You know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and follow it that way. But. All right, well, any, any other any feedback, other? feel free to, like, send it along, too, if you want to take some time to take a look at it and we'll kind of continue to revise it. And this will be sort of integrated into the introduction chapter. So it would um, be, uh, there would be text, and this would be, it would reference this? Yeah, so, and, and I think that it's important to have it out front in the plan because we are touching on um, right. different elements of, of climate change in the chapters, and we want to make sure that people have... Um, a place to turn to to know sort of what the science is that we're using when we make sort of some statements and when we explain what these potential impacts are going to be that this is the the, the information that we're going off of yeah and we don't want to say it in every single chapter obviously right. so on the front page how do those one two three four five the references the source materials um, how do they line up with each point? Yeah, kind yeah, of. I was thinking about adding that in. Um, I and I will do that. I think I can probably put some really small footnotes without making it sort of more congested yeah, so or, that you can... Or maybe somewhere else to reflect mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, you don't want 16 footnotes. Well, there wouldn't be 16. There's only no. five. So, um, <coughs> so there wouldn't be actually any more footnotes. It would just be... Um, uh, with the with each bullet point, mm -hmm. if it were that simple. I mean, if you if you did yeah, it, numbers, it will be. It is that simple. Oh, so, so yeah. the, I, I was going to add on the on the PDF version of this um, summary. Mm -hmm. um, the the footnotes are um, are links. They're live. You can click on them with your mouse and go straight to the document. And oh, I see. And all yeah. five of uh, these these sources are pretty interesting reading. Yes. Okay. Good. I saw I watched that, but I didn't click on anything. Okay. All right, well, thank you for the comments. Thank you so much. That. Um, that's all we have for that item. Pick one. Um, the next agenda item is next steps. Who's that? Okay. Back to Liz. <laughs> Our next steps, um, we are working on the natural resources chapter now, um, and so we'll be sending that one out to you next, and um, that is on our agenda for March 10th. Okay. Um, are there any other, any comments, questions? Are we done with comp plan for tonight? Is no, I, I don't have any <coughs> okay. at this point. Is there uh, any oh. other business? We I forgot at the no. beginning to ask if we had any correspondence. No. Werner? Nothing? No, sir. Nothing to report. Um, uh, um, I'll make a motion to adjourn then. I'll accept that motion. Second? Second. Second. All in favor? Oh, good. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it.